and welcome to week six with UQCS. It's been a very long week, I'm sure uh, many of you guys may have been at the hackathon across the weekend. I hope you're all recovered and rested from that because, you know, some of us are still getting there. Um, so yeah, today we have Andrew giving his talk on regex. Um, I'll let him explain it, um, but yeah, he was our ex-treasurer from last year and um, he's still here, so yeah. <laughs> it sounds so accusatory. Um, anyway, yeah, hello, I'm Andrew, I'm a third year CS student, I'm ex-committee, I'm on the infra team, which means I shitpost too much and I do stuff with the Discord bot, um, and regex, I like regex, I like it a lot, probably too much, some might say, um, that's why we have this talk. So, firstly, we have note on plurals. You may have seen somewhere uh, that people pluralize regexes as regexon. Here at Regex Wizardry Incorporated, this is patently wrong, right? We consider this heresy. Uh, hope this short series of diagrams will explain why. So, this is a comprehensive and reasonable set of plurals. You have a word and you shorten it, and their plurals follow the same pattern. This makes no sense. What is this? We don't do this, no one does this, that's bad. Regex, same pattern. You shorten it, it's the same. What? <laughs> anyway, like Larry Wall made a comment about calling them Regex and once, but he wrote Pearl, and like Pearl honestly, honest to God, lets you do that, and that's just not on. That's not okay. So we're ignoring Larry Wall, it's not Regex, it's Regexes. Or regices, if you really feel fancy, but regex is what we'll be using for this talk. Question: Why is it regex instead of regex? Because it sounds nicer. <laughs> <laughs> that is a valid response. <laughs> Too bad. All right. Plurals aside, what actually is regex? If you ask Wikipedia, it'll tell you it's a way to match patterns in text. But that's not really very helpful, is it? Why is it called regular? What does that mean? It means something, presumably. Uh, what can it do really? What are its limits? How does it work in the background? Well, we have a bit of theory. Uh, don't be frightened of math. Um, you can't become a wizard without a little bit of theory. So notation first. Um, we have the idea of a language, which is a set of strings. And a string is a, a sequence, so order matters, of characters. And it can also be empty, so you can have an empty string. So, the set of languages that are regular is starts like this, we have the empty language, so nothing. If I say no words, that is a regular language. The all singleton languages, so languages that contain only one character, they are all regular. If I say every, every, every string that is just A, that is a regular language. And then we start to build on these two things. We have the union of any two languages, so you can have A or B, that's a regular language. Concatenation, so the string AB, where A is some regular language and B is some regular language, is also itself regular. The magical clean star, which is named after Stephen Clean, uh, it means take one or more, sorry, zero or more repetitions of an existing language. So. A or AA or AAA or AAAA or so on and so forth. Uh, this is the, the way that we get to sort of infinity by using regular languages, is this is our only operation that lets us sort of go, well, these things can have infinite length. So they're allowed to be infinitely long and still be regular, as long as they follow these patterns. And that's basically it. There's nothing else that is regular that set um, constructed using those rules encompasses every possible regular language. There's no, nothing else is regular. Uh, when they, they, regexes do have syntax variety that is more than what's just here, but that's just for syntax. It doesn't actually expand the set of things that are regular at all. So another way to define regular languages is to say that we're here. So we live in finite state machine land. Is that visible? It is? Wow, that's good. Um, we're, so we're here. So finite state, which means we don't have any sort of idea of infinite context. The amount of context we can have is purely bounded by what we can code into our regex. The idea is that that, that, that just means, the classical example of that, sorry, is palindromes. 
So in order to match a palindrome, we need to remember what the first half is in order to check the second half matches the first half. But you can't do that with regex. It's impossible to create a regex that will remember what was in the first half because you can't, you can't code that in. That's just not a thing you can do. I did, however, just lie a little bit. There are back references, but back references are themselves not completely all you need to get out of finite state machine land. They get out of you, they get a little bit out and let you do some fun things, but they're not quite enough to get out to like the complete Turing machine land of fun computation and palindromes and stuff. So they are they are they do exist, but they do cheat a little bit. Alright, it's all the math. Ish. So regexes, we now know they're a series of characters that match text. Um, they're closely linked to but and get their name from regular languages which is this fancy set of languages that we formally defined in a way that no one really cares about. Um, but they do include some features that break out of that st strictly theoretical mold. But how do they look like? I'm sure you've all seen the horrific, godforsaken, long strings of regex that are just brackets and brackets and square brackets and backslashes and more square brackets. There was one on the first slide um, it's not very fun. I don't recommend anyone ever using a regex like that. They are very prone to doing terrible things to your code if you do. Um, different languages will have different syntaxes for regex or different flavors of regex. Um, you can also call them dialects, but I'm feeling tasty, so we'll call them flavors. Uh, for the most part, the syntax I'm covering here is flavor independent but I, there are some things that will change. I've done my best to point them out, but if you start using some like Go or something, they might be different, I don't know. Don't use Go at your own risk. Uh, the first thing for regex is straight text match. So string matches string. Sweet, that's it, that's done. That is, that is the first and easiest way to define a regex. Any text with no meta characters is still just a regex. It's just that it's also a string, and you can use string things on it, which are a little bit faster, generally. You can also do or. So here we have foo or bar. We'll match either of those two things. Uh, now we start getting the fun ones. So an example here is matching a sentence that might use different adjectives in some place. As long as those adjectives are drawn from some sort of finite list that you can stick in your regex, you can still just use or and have, you know, this is a, a good or a bad day. That's a regex. Character classes. So this is a nice and convenient way to define or over a lot of characters at once. So string will match S or T or R or I or N or G when it's placed within these brackets. Uh, you usually use these in, con in conjunction with some sort of clean star like or any sort of quantifying operation. So you say, I want one or more things from this class of characters. There's also the opposite, invert, little carrot there, so anything that's not listed in, this, in these brackets is now considered part of this character class. So here it'll be A, B, C, D, E, F, etc, etc, uh, just not string. Uh, this will also include, be careful here, these also end up including all digits and all other characters, because regex is defined over text, not just over letters. Now, the fun ones, quantifiers. So, the three main super obvious quantifiers. Uh, hopefully my color notation here makes a little bit of sense. Um, yellow and blue, green, all three, black, red and blue, just the purple. Is that, okay. I thought I'd be fun with that one, but it's kind of a bit silly in hindsight. Um, so, the question mark matches zero or one. The plus matches one or more and the star matches zero or more. So the star is, I don't really care at all. The question mark is, it might be there, it might not, but there's only one of them. And the plus is, there's at least one. These are used, so for numbers of unknown size is a common one. You can say, you know, zero to nine plus, and then you have at least one number. That's a number. The last thing I'll note is that you can see they're actually only applying to the very last character. So on their own, without stuff like brackets that I'll get to in one second, uh, they will just do this. Right? They don't match 
string multiple times, they match string and then the last character G multiple times. To get around that, brackets. So the brackets are very useful for other things, they will come up later, um, but for now, the idea is just that they group regexes into sub-regexes, and then you can apply quantifiers into those groups, or you can apply anything else onto those groups as well. And it will just apply to that whole group rather than just the preceding character. The last quantifier-based note is the question mark. So quantifiers are usually greedy, which means they will try and match as much as they physically can. This is a quick demo here. Um, I haven't explained dot yet, but dot matches anything. And so the idea is that this blue one here, the dot star question mark, will start at the question mark and go, and as soon as it sees a question mark, it's not greedy, it'll stop. But this one here, no question mark, it is greedy, so it will keep going as long as it possibly can until it finds a question mark, and then it will stop. So if you have multiple quotes in your text, question mark will stop at the first one, no question mark, all of them. Quick syntax break. Syntax of regex is like 23 slides in this talk. I'm not giving them to you all at once. Um, here are two commands that I find very useful for working with regex. In short, we have find and replace, and then find. I'm using them as proxies here because I didn't really feel like screenshotting every single IDE ever and saying, look, this is find and replace in your IDE of choice. So I'm using these ones, but keep in mind you can use regex in a lot of different things. It exists in VS Code, it exists everywhere else. Um, don't stress about command syntax if you don't like it very much. How do I get my mouse back, please? There we go. Uh, so, they're both ed. It's all ed, it always has been. Funny bit. Uh, here are three cases that are, I find very useful. So you can search with regex in a file, you can search with regex in a folder, you can search file names with regex. If you're doing 2310 or 3301, um, shameless plug, these commands are really useful, but also I don't recognize anyone in particular, so there's probably not that many to people doing it. So uh, The other one is said, same thing, find and replace. Uh, find and replace with regex is really, really fantastic once you get to groups. Uh, groups, replacing stuff with groups using regex is one of the most fantastic things you can do with regex. Um, it's one of the real strengths, I find, is being able to match some text and then output the text and output parts of what you matched in your replacement as well as whatever else you want to do at the time. Back into it. Meta characters. Um, dot, I've mentioned before, matches everything. Carrot matches the start of the string, or in stuff like grep or set, it will match the start of a line. Uh, dollar sign will match the end. So if you want to say, oh, this thing happens but only at the very start of, the, of a line, then you would use dollar, and if you would say, oh, this thing happens but only at the very end of a line, oh, other way around, mm -hmm. you would use carrot, and if you want to say this thing happens only at the very, very end, you would use dollar. Uh, next, pre-made character classes. So there are some character classes, remember they are string in square brackets. Uh, there are some of them that exist already. We don't have to think about them at all. They just sort of exist and we can use them because they're, they're nice and convenient. So if you want to match a lot of characters, think any alphanumeric character. This gets cumbersome real fast, right? We have to write A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and so on. It gets very painful. So instead, we have the ability to do dashes, which is stuff like oh, I want any character in between these two. So you can have A to Z, any lowercase character. A to Z, A to Z, which is any lowercase character or any uppercase character. And then you can expand that a little bit further and you get slash W. <coughs> slash W is the regex sort of standard way to say any word character. This is one of the things that is very, very commonly switched out in different flavors of regex, but word is common to all of them. It actually just means that. So A to Z, A to Z, 0 to 9, underscore. But I know which one I'd rather type, and I know which one looks better in a long regex, rather than having that written out multiple times. The next one we have that's very common and appears in 
basically every flavor of regex is slash s, which is any space characters, any white space. So stuff like carriage returns, new lines, tabs, um, whatever f and v are, I don't actually know, um, and space are all things that are matched by this slash s. So if you want to say something like, oh, I have some text and then some space, you would use slash s for that space. And that way it doesn't matter if it's a tab or a space or an enter, anything like that will still work. Our third and final common character class is slash d, which is a little bit less exciting. It's just zero to nine. Um, the reason we use w and d a lot more as well is that in Unicode flavors of regex, they've written out these regex character classes a lot longer and in a lot more detail and make them actually handle Unicode nicely. So if you want to do Unicode, um, don't try and write up one of them that includes like Armenian. Just, just use the W and call it. I have a question. I feel like I've said something wrong here now. Does W include emojis? Ah, uh, that's a f mm, that's actually really good. I don't think so. I think it's limited to text characters and digits and underscores. Because it doesn't include any sort of other text punctuation, right? It doesn't include QAQ. <laughs> what, sorry? QAQ. <laughs> Yeah, if you write your text emojis like that, yeah, Q underscore Q. Um, no, any sort of Unicode emojis, I would assume are not. Um, that is probably flavor dependent, um, but I would assume no. All right, now I have an interlude where we look at some examples of regex in the wild. These examples are taken straight from UQCS bot um, because it was easy. Come on, it's right there. I just had to do Control F. Um, all right, groups are coming, I promise. I will get to groups. I've said groups are really cool. I will get to groups. Um, Regex and UQCS bot mostly gets just used for input sanitization. So we're trying to standardize it, but that's surprisingly annoying. Um, so there are still a few mixed around that are a bit annoying. Uh, I did actually find these regexes by using another regex. So it's regexception. Um, I just used grep and grep-r, and that's still regex. So, yep, I use the regex to find the regex. It's regex all the way down, baby. Cool. First one. Ripped straight from yelling. This is the one for emojis. Bradley's redoing that at the moment, so it might not be there. I don't know anymore. Nothing's fun. Uh, cool. Let's break it down. That looks violently horrific. But, I promise it's not that bad, right? We start with HTTP. Sweet, that's just text, we match that. We have an S question mark. S question mark just means zero or one S's. Sweet, so HTTP, maybe S, maybe not. Colon, two slashes, strictly speaking, those two slashes don't need to be escaped with backslashes, um, but regex is very pernickety about like, what is a meta character and what's not. So if you're ever in doubt, just stick a backslash in it and it can't hurt. Um, and then we had this character class bit at the end, and what that's saying is we now want any character that's not from this set, and this set is white space. And we want more than one of them, one or more of them. So that's saying any number of characters until you see a space. So all in all, HTTP, maybe S, maybe not, colon slash slash, and then a bunch of text up until any white space occurs. Now that's a pretty short regex. Knowing what it is, it's a little bit easy to pass. This is the sort of thing that we want regex to look like in the wild. It's something you can look at and go, oh, I, can't, I can kind of get that immediately. It's not a giant, horrific mass of groups. Our next example are uh, emojis. This one, I think, handles animated emojis, which is why the A exists. So we'll break this one down too. What have we got? We got open, open crocodile, um, a question mark, so zero or one a, colon, slash w plus, so one or more of this thing, uh, another colon, slash d plus, so one or more number, and then close crocodile. Uh, remember Python handles Unicode nicely, so these aren't entirely 100% accurate, so this one is also including like Armenian and all that sort of stuff in there as well, but I didn't really want to write that out. So just pretend it includes Armenian. 
And also, none of our emojis have a minion in them anyway, so we should be right. The site I recommend for working this stuff out is Regex 101. I will shameless plug it here, not sponsored, but um, I'm free, so call me. Um, it looks like this, very fantastic. You stick a regex in, you stick a string in, and then you can actually watch it, see how it matches, see why it matches or see why it doesn't match. The explanation thing up in the top right there uh, actually explains step by step what each character or each sequence of characters is doing in your regex, which one's doing what, why it is working, why it's not working. If you have syntax errors, they'll appear there as well, which is usually stuff like mismatched brackets. Um, this will also generate errors if you have stuff like catastrophic backtracking or you have stuff like uh, non-fixed width lookarounds, um, which I'll get to in a second as well. We also have a quick reference and multiple flavors. So it does handle PHP, JavaScript, Python, and Perl. And I think that's it. Um, maybe more, maybe less, I don't know. But. What's the difference? The different like flavors. Yes. Uh, usually, it's limited to just what um, character <coughs> classes come pre-built in. So slash w slash d and slash s, word, digit, and space. They're in all of them, but the rest of them all have a lot of variation. So a lot of a few, I think, Perl from memory includes the ability to do like slash p and then braces and then write like slash p Armenian and it will match any Armenian character, which is pretty fun if you're into Armenian. Um, what else, what are the other good options? Um, said, said flavored regex requires you to backslash your brackets when you do groups, which is really painful and annoying. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just tiny syntax things. Um, and the big one is character classes, which ones are included and which ones aren't included. But yeah, speaking of groups, groups, ah, I skipped a slow. Uh, uh, groups, brackets. Very cool. So brackets, as we saw earlier, they let you group up your stuff and they let you apply operators to a whole set of brackets all at once. But they also save what you've written, what you've matched inside that bracket and then you can use it later, which is fantastically useful. Um, there are five types of group all in all. Uh, one of them is this one. It's the most important one because it's just the standard group. It's used for everything. Uh, there are also four varieties of look around, which is look ahead, look behind. Um, I think one of these will be covered by the camera of me streaming. So uh, if you're on live stream, sorry, that one's pay to win. Um, look ahead, negative look ahead. So look ahead will do, does this thing exist in front of me without actually going and consuming that text? So you can then match it again later or you can not match it at all. Negative will do the same thing, but opposite. It'll say, is this thing not in front of me? Uh, then there's look behind and negative look behind. Mm. And look behinds are a little bit special in that they have to be fixed width. You cannot use the clean star or the plus or anything else. They have to have a strict maximum length. Otherwise, your regex will break and it will wind at you and say a quantifier inside a look behind makes it non-fixed width, which is a horrific error message that I don't wish on anyone. Here's, I now have an example of groups, group find and replace, which I found very useful. Um, there's that one. That looks really kind of bad, but I've highlighted in blue, group and then use of group. I'll split this up now. Um, skip the said syntax because it's said, and I didn't come in to learn about said. Sweet. So we found the top one, replaced it with the bottom one. And our brackets in blue, you can see they've formed a group. And then slash one here actually refers to that group. So what we've done here is we've found two numbers dash two numbers. Every time we find them, we save them. And now our replacement, we're putting in square bracket, square bracket. And inside that square bracket, we can put in what we've just matched. So instead of just blindly finding and replacing, or worse, copying and pasting and typing that all out, we've actually now automatically ripped out all of them and stuck them in those brackets and added this CSS stuff as well without any thought involved. We've just written a little regex that's done it. So group find and replace here, fantastically useful. Realistically, this looks like this. 
So we've got this input string here of 0, 0, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 1, 5. And we've grouped them and replaced them and found and added that extra stuff around them. Sweet, fantastic. One command or one control H in VS Code, whatever your favorite IDE is, will be able to do this with regex, TM. Be remiss of me not to mention this is one of the things I do dislike about regex as well, is syntax for replacing groups is not standardized in the slightest. So um, if you want to use that one, go home and Google how do I replace groups in regex. I think VS Code uses the slash one syntax like this, but Python uses slash g angle brackets one. Uh, so there is some variation there, which is kind of very cringe, but that's life. Um, sweet. So, syntax done. Okay, um, they will not be a quiz at the end, I can't be bothered, and it's like 20 slides, it's fine. Um, the idea is not that you look at that and you get everything instantly and you're like, oh, I'm a regex wizard now. The idea is that we've broken it down and none of it is individually that hard, so hopefully it's not terrible to go and look at regex now and go like, oh, okay, I recognize a few of those things and I know enough to Google the rest. Quick note now on how it works in the background. How does it actually do what it does? Um, I mentioned earlier it's all finite state machines. Under the hood, it is actually not all finite state machines because finite state machines have some performance penalties but also some performance bonuses. So sometimes it's finite state machines, but sometimes it's not. The first and uh, most sort of ancient algorithm for regex is this thing called power set construction. Um, the idea is that you can create a finite state machine really easily and then convert it to a deterministic finite state machine very, very sort of using this algorithm. I wouldn't say it's easy. It, does, it is fairly hefty. But, um, but then once you have your deterministic finite state machine, you can just run it on your text. And that is linear at absolute worst because you are consuming every character once, feeding it into your machine, and your machine is going, does this match yes or no? So all in all, setup is exponential, kind of bad, kind of sad. Um, it's exponential in the complexity of your regex. So if you have a really easy regex, it's not difficult. But if you have a really complicated and annoying regex, it gets really annoying to sort of compile it into a, into a finite state machine. But then it matches in linear time. Unfortunately, it does have no fun features like backtracking and lookarounds because they're not things that finite state machines can do. So we do lose that one, which is very unfortunate. The next one is lazy DFA. So the idea here is not so much that we construct a DFA all the time, but that we simulate our deterministic finite automaton at every step and then throw it away, and then simulate it again. And this avoids the compilation step in return for only a little bit more processing time. So this one ends up being basically free to set up, because you don't have to think about it at all to set it up. When it runs, its runtime is proportional more to the size of the regex as well as the size of the input. Um, but again, we are still simulating a finite state machine, and so we still do not get those fun features. If we want the fun features, we go to backtracking. And backtracking is the most common implementation of regex for this reason, because people are attached to their fun features, um, and they are very useful features at that, but they do have some sort of downside, which is that backtracking has this thing called catastrophic backtracking. And that's saying their runtime of backtracking is actually exponential in the worst case. So the absolute worst, your runtime will actually end up being exponential in the amount of input you have, and that means it gets very, very slow, very, very fast. Catastrophic backtracking is basically a regex meme at this point. Um, it's got its own like CVE for like my regex is bad and I've dosed my app because someone submitted something they shouldn't, and it just the regex chewed up like a million years of processing time. Um, so in a few slides I will talk about how to avoid that, how that works, why that happens. 
but now we know how it works, let's have a look at what it absolutely can't do. So, remember finite state machines, we're here-ish, we do have backtracking, which means we're not strictly there, but like we're close enough, right? We're pretty, we're pretty mostly there. There is a fantastic Stack Overflow post, which I'll reference now, which asks, how do you match some HTML tags with regex? And HTML, you kind of can't do that, right? And this answer was prompted by this guy called Bobbins, and he wrote this, which is like unreasonably metal for a Stack Overflow post about regex, right? Like, that's insane. But he's right, right? Mathematically speaking, you kind of can't do it. And the reason why is because we are here. There's a hierarchy of languages. Some languages are fundamentally, mathematically more complicated than other languages. This is basically related to how much context they need to remember, how much memory they need to have. If you think about it, most problems in computability just come down to how much memory do you have. Because if you have enough memory, you can just remember everything and then you'll figure it out eventually. Um, regular languages are at the lowest level of this hierarchy, right? They're at the very bottom. But HTML lives up here. So it has a lot more things in it that regex just simply is not mathematically equipped to deal with. It requires you remember a lot more stuff. And that remembering just sort of fundamentally means your regex will never be able to do HTML. Most programming languages live in this recursively enumerable space, but it is sort of pretty varied and it's very, very random. Uh, I wouldn't say it's random, it's actually very strictly mathematically defined, but it's random as far as I care. Um, they line up like this. Um, those arrows are sort of hard to read, but uh, the idea is that regular will line up with finite state machines. Context-free languages line up with push-down automaton, which is like, the idea is that you have a finite state machine, but you also have basically a stack where you can push and pop stuff. Um, and then recursively enumerable things are only passable by a Turing machine. Uh, there is one in the middle there that we skipped, but that's because it's related to like some funky variation of Turing machines that are bound in memory, and it's just weird. Um, so we'll pass on that one. Uh, the next regex example I have here actually is from a shit post in UQCS a little while ago, which was, can we do this in pure Python? Can we write Python that will do this to Python like automatically, right? Write a preprocessor ish that will actively modify Python. And can we do this with regex? Is, was my question. Um, here's what I got. Um, that looks pretty grim. Uh, it turns out you actually kind of can't because Python itself, <coughs> this is the sort of problem where you do need to remember a lot of things. And once you start remembering things, you start having context. And you start getting into like the land that that other guy on Stack Overflow was talking about, where you, Russian hackers pulling a web app and people weep. Um, so our main problems we have with doing this, right, is that we have these things in Python. We have comments. We have quotes that go over multiple lines. We have format strings and we have regular strings. So format strings are the big one here because they can sort of go inside themselves infinitely. You can have like a format string inside of a format string inside of a format string inside of a format string inside of, a format string inside of and so on, right? You need to remember all of those levels because as if you're looking for a four, you don't know it's not in a string unless you know how many levels of string you're in. So remembering that goes infinitely deep, boom, not regex, very sad. That's the, the whirlwind quick math talk about why that doesn't work. Right, catastrophic backtracking. Uh, this is the most common failure mode of regex. Uh, actually, probably the second most common after trying to do something that you actually mathematically can't. But here's an example, a short example that, oh, hang on, a short example that catastrophically backtracks. So that regex um, looks fairly small, looks fairly easy. Um, if you use a backtracking engine, this will catastrophically backtrack on an input that looks like this. And so, the idea here is that the back tracker will try and match A or AA until it sees a B. And so when you have a long series of A's, 
and then the last thing's not a B, it will have to try every combination, basically, of A or AA, or AA or AA, or so on and so forth. And that becomes exponential, and then you don't have a fun time. It basically doubles every time you add an extra A to that input. So that is really not fun. That's why you do this, but you need three conditions in order for catastrophic backtracking. Those three conditions are on my previous slide, so I'll go back. Um, the three things you need are a sub-expression that matches the same thing in multiple ways. So that's how it splits. It has to check this and this. It has to check that and that, and that's how your tree starts. Uh, it needs to be repeated a lot. So ideally, this is a star style operation where it can be repeated infinitely. But even if you specify numerically the number of matches you want to have, that's still going to cause problems. And it has to have a terminator, some sort of terminating character that may or may not be present. So if you have all those three things, that's a candidate for your catastrophic backtracking, which is what you want to avoid. So the best way to avoid this sort of is to just take away one of those things. So in this example, um, this example is incredibly contrived and I sort of can't do it. But the standard way to fix this is to just make sure all of the things inside your sub-expression are mutually exclusive. So if you do that, suddenly they don't overlap and you don't have this explosion of states where everything can be everything, can be everything, can be everything until you get to a terminator that doesn't exist. So, I shall leave you with six rules for wise regex use. Uh, rule one, keep them short. So all the examples I've had here, um, I wouldn't say all actually, that's wrong, I do have a couple that are longer. But all the good examples I have here are within sort of 10 characters. Um, it's better to have 10 10 character regexes than one 100 character regex. Right? If you're reading code, you're in the mindset of the language of the, that the code is written in. You're, in, you know, you're reading Python, you're reading OCaml, you're reading Scala, whatever. Um, you're not reading regex, right? So if you see a regex, you should be able to quickly identify what it's doing and then get back to the actual code you're reading, right? The other thing is if one of these small regexes is failing, it's a lot easier to debug, oh, that one there is failing, it's only four characters or whatever, than this gigantic, humongous, 100 character behemoth is failing somewhere. I don't know where, but somewhere in there it's failing. Next rule, keep them commented. Keep them short, keep them commented. So by commenting your regex, you're sort of ensuring that it's readable beyond even what's in the regex. If you get someone who's coming along and looking at your code and has no idea what the regex does, they can still just read the comment and then get on with their life. Um, they're not supposed to sit there and go, uh, brackets, uh. <coughs> this is also helpful for you in the future. <laughs> TM. Um, I've written regex before, and then you come back to it, and then you're like, oh, what the hell is I doing? Right? Like, keep them commented and keep them short, and then you'll be able to always come back to it as well and see what it's like later on. Hoist out as much logic as you can into the actual code. This is based on point one a little bit, but it's also sort of its own point where at some point it becomes easier to just deal with like nested ifs than it does to deal with like a gigantic regex. At some point it's, it's literally just easier to be like, okay, if it matches this short thing and it matches this short thing and it matches this short thing, you know they're an and, right? You can read the word and or you can read the double ampersand in whatever language, right? It's a lot harder to read that regex if it's all just bunched up together. Split out your concepts into different regexes and use them all individually. Uh, make sure you can't catastrophically backtrack yourself and have bad times. Um, the easiest way to do that is to just make sure whenever you have a sub-expression that is happening multiple times, you're always checking that each one of the things in that sub-expression are mutually exclusive. There's no way that they overlap and then generate this massive tree of grim. Make sure it's a regular problem. That's the big one. I spent a lot of time going in circles and like 
not having a fun time, just to realize that what I'm looking for is not actually a thing. The regex I'm seeking does not exist. The combination of magic runes just does, it's not there. Um, there's no way I can pass what I'm doing with regex. And at that point, you've wasted so much time and you're just like, oh, what the hell am I doing? So try and always think about your problem first. The easiest way or the most intuitive way I find to think about it is, is this thing something that requires any sort of memory whatsoever? And if it requires any sort of memory, it's not regexable. Some exceptions apply. Um, but they, yeah, so try and avoid wasting a lot of time writing regexes and writing ever increasingly complicated regexes for things that you actually just can't do. And finally, with great power comes great responsibility. Try and use this regex knowledge wisely. Don't become that guy who just sticks regex in everything and then you're just like, oh, what is this? The regex guy's been here. I can't believe this guy. <laughs> I know, because I was that guy. I'd like definitely certified. I probably still am. Um, but yeah, try and use regex wisely. Try and be nice with it. Keep them short, keep them simple. And hopefully you'll have a good time. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you're juggling like three things at once. Awesome. Well, um, thanks, Andrew, for that really awesome rejects talk. Um, yeah, my claim to fame with rejects is you may notice that you cannot post any Discord links in the UQCS Discord channel, and that is because of rejects. So, you know, real world use cases. Yeah, for sure. Um, anyway, so as for what's happening now, um, we should have pizza arriving pretty soon uh, at some point. So, yeah, if you just want to stick around, um, other than that, um, yeah, you can keep a look out on events that are coming up with UQCS. Um, the big one that's coming up next is the high frequency networking event that's happening in week eight on Wednesday. So if you want to come and meet some of our sponsors, um, yeah, go, go to that event. It's going to be really fun at Storybridge Hotel. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, see you.